Okay, so <clears throat> the last century or century and a half has been called the century of biology or even the century of genetics because it's really been a fantastic and interesting adventure. Because as recently as in the middle of the 19th century, we had no idea how heredity worked. Starting with Mendel's work and that actually entered the scientific discourse only at the beginning of the 20th century, we started with the idea that genes are some abstract entities that determine certain traits of organisms. For example, there is a gene that makes plant grow tall or short. There is a gene that makes the flowers red or white. There is a gene that makes flies eyes white instead of red, etc., etc. So abstract entities that determine certain traits. And from that, in about a century, we went to this, to a very good understanding of the very chemical and physical language of the genes. We know that genes are made of DNA. We understand the alphabet of DNA. We can read it. We can even rewrite it. We can take a gene from one organism and put it in a different organism, like here. A, a gene from a jellyfish was put into different animals, making them fluorescent. By the way, this is not just a party trick. This is a very good tool to study where genes work in a given organism. And soon, some say, we might get to modifying humans, to getting custom designed babies with better minds, better bodies, better everything. Well, not so fast. It's not as easy as it seems, even though, thanks to this enormous development of genetics from nothing at the beginning of the 20th century to where we are now, we know pretty well how a gene works. We understand how A, T, Cs and Gs get read, get translated into proteins that make our cells. Biology textbooks are full of this information. Of course, we still work on the details, but we already have a pretty good idea about how it works. These days, I could take DNA from any one of you and read every single letter written in this DNA. It would take a few days and about a few hundred euros to do it for any single individual, and the databases are full of such information. I can find genes in the DNA of any other organism, although if you look carefully at those gene lists, you will mostly see the names of awful diseases that happens when one of those genes goes wrong. You don't see a gene for intelligence, beauty, talent, etc. Why is that? Why is that not so simple? Because maybe if we can read DNA, if we understand DNA, then maybe we can realize what has for a long time been a sci-fi vision, that we can take DNA from anyone and predict their future, their talents, the possibilities that determine their entire future life. Well, not so fast. Let's start with something simple, something that may be familiar from those of you who took some genetics at, in high school. There is not a single gene that determines the color of your eyes. If you believe that from your school, then it's wrong. But it's still simple. There are about six genes that make your eyes dark brown or bright blue. When you read and check about a dozen genes, you can make a pretty good prediction about a person's color of hair or eyes. Again, not as simple as it might seem, but doable, you need a dozen genes, some mathematics, and you can predict whether some, somebody's eyes look like this or like this. But that's still a simple example. Let's take something more challenging. How tall you are. There is not a single gene that makes you tall 
or short, to understand why some people grow real tall and some not so much, you need to look into at least 200 different genes. And I can tell you that at the moment we don't have enough mathematical theory of how those genes interact to make this prediction. I cannot take your DNA and predict, oh, you should be about six feet tall. No, there, it is not possible. It can be done for, uh, for traits that depend on a dozen genes, but not on those that depend on 200 genes. And that's all not yet that complex. Because if we look at some other traits, is there a gene that makes you behave in a certain way? For example, is there a gene that makes you more likely to enjoy dangerous behaviors, like jumping from a perfectly good airplane? There were headlines in the newspapers that there is a gene that makes you a risk taker. No, it's not true. Complex behaviors depend on many genes. There is not a single risk taking gene. There is not a single intelligence gene. There is no smart gene. At least a thousand or two thousand genes would be necessary to explain the hereditary basics of, of intelligence. There is no, not a single gene that makes you susceptible to common diseases like heart diseases, like most cancers, like autoimmune diseases, etc. There are some diseases that depend on single genes, but they are very, very rare. The common ones depend on thousands of different genes. So the common theme is that you cannot explain the traits of organisms by looking at single genes. You need to look at the interactions between many genes. And that's a very common theme in the entire field of biology, that complexity is built from interaction of simple elements, like those Lego bricks. It's not hard to understand a single element. Those bricks, children understand them. But the complexity lies in the interactions between those elements. Human genome has about 20,000 genes, so 20,000 bricks. And the complexity of this is not the complexity of the single elements, it's their combinations, it's their interactions. So in need, if you want to understand the whole, you need to understand not just the elements, but how they interact. And how can we approach those complex interactions in genetics? One of the ways to look at it is to realize that interacting elements form networks, and the world is made of networks. Here you can see airline connection networks. Anybody who's planned a longer journey has experienced this. You can see that these are not just random connections. There are hubs that are connected to each other and peripheries that are connected to hubs, and this can be described in a certain formal manner. Your brain it's also a network. It's composed of a hundred billion elements called neurons. And we start to map all those interactions. There is a project, so-called human connectome project, to understand all those connections. And the elements are quite simple. They are called neurons or nerve cells, and we understand them already pretty well. We can model how a single nerve cell behaves but we take a hundred billion of them and we have your mind, unpredictable and complex. The complexity is built on interaction and knowing the elements is not enough to know the entire system. All, another example, social networks. People interact with each other and these days everybody does it online. That's an example of a Twitter followers network that's Facebook connections. And if you look at those, this picture, it may resemble what you've seen on this airline connection map. There are also hubs and peripheries. Everybody has this friend who knows thousands of people. And when you see who is friends with those 
central hubs, you can find out that few steps are enough to connect you to about anyone. There is a theory that says that six handshakes, six steps are enough to connect any two people in the entire world. If the world is made of networks, we need some means, some way to understand, to describe networks. And we can do it in biology as well. So let's make a Facebook of genes. Let's make a social network of genes. That's a picture from a recent paper showing interactions between genes in a simple yeast cell. As you can see, the scientists map mapped all the interactions. It has only, it has only about 6,000 genes, so less than a human cell. And you can see that there are genes that are hubs that have many connections, and there are peripheries that have less connections. The hubs are connected to each other. Which hub a gene is connected to can tell us a lot about its function, etc. We can learn a lot studying the social network of genes. Like on Facebook, when I find out who your friends are, for example, if you have friends who are university students and like, I don't know, climbing mountains, then you're probably a student who likes climbing, etc. So in this, again, when I see who are the friends of a given gene, I can make a very good prediction about what this gene does. But this is just the beginning. We need a more deeper way of describing it. And of course, any deeper knowledge in science comes from mathematics. And mathematics provides us with a formal way of describing networks. The seminal paper was published in the 1990s by a Hungarian-American mathematician, Albert Laszlo Barabasi, and he described a way of predicting network behavior based on their properties. And the cool thing is that the mathematics is not a terribly hard. I'm not a mathematician, I'm a biologist, and I can follow it. If you are okay with high school level mathematics, you can follow it, and the handbook is available online, it's open, and you can all try and look how it, how it works and how it can be applied to biology, to social networks, to politics, to economics, to anything. But is that enough? Is describing those networks enough? Where we are at now in genetics is essentially making inventories of parts. We take the DNA of different organisms, we list the genes that are there, and by a very slow and expensive process, we find out the interactions between them. We make those maps, we, may, we map all those connections. But this, even this may not be enough, because these are just connections between two elements. What if the real true knowledge is hidden in the interactions that involve three or four elements at the same time. Then you draw such map not on a two-dimensional plane, but in an n-dimensional uh, space. That's where it gets harder even for mathematicians. So maybe we need something more. Something more, maybe not human. Because in modern science, we realized that artificial intelligence algorithms are very good at spotting regularities in enormous sets of data. All this very famous big data approach. This is what's used by companies that gather all this seemingly irrelevant information about us, combine it into huge databases and then use it to make more money of us using machine learning, using computer programs that learn to spot patterns in huge oceans of data. So maybe this is the approach that can help us in genetics. And it's been tried recently. In September last year, there was a paper where 
the scientists took faces of a few hundred people, measured them, and fed this data into the computer machine learning program, and then gave the same program the information about the complete genome, complete DNA sequence of all those persons, and made this artificial neural network learn the patterns. And the program learned to predict how a person's face looks like based on the DNA. On the left is the photograph, on the right is what the program gives you. So as you can see, they kind of look like this. There, there is a huge discussion about this paper, whether it's really correct or not, whether it's really very predictive or not. Uh, there were re replies, counter replies, etc. But this is the beginning of something that can be very promising, but can also be the end of science. Why? Because science is about explaining the complex by something which is simpler. About this is how our understanding of the world increases. And here we have a machine that makes the prediction. It gives us the practical aspect of science. It works. It can predict something. But we don't understand any more than we did before. It doesn't increase our knowledge because what happens in this algorithm is as complex as, as, and as impenetrable to us as the biological reality. So if this is the only way, this is the end of science as we know it. I hope not, but we'll see. It's going to be exciting either way. Whichever way it progresses, and we have only started to understand how complex the problems of genetics are, one thing is certain, and it was already noticed by a great scientist, a great physicist, who at the beginning of our century said, I think the next century will be the century of complexity. And this is true in all different branches of science, genetics included. And this is why genetics is still hard because we know the parts, we know the elements, we know the sim single Lego bricks, we know how they work, but now we need to understand how they interact and how they combine to make complex system. And this is the future of genetics in the next decades. And for that, we need one important thing, we need to be interdisciplinary because we need collaboration between biologists, mathematicians, physicists, philosophers, maybe even humanists. So what is really important is what you did during the break, networking, where biology students networked with mathematics or physics or computer science students or philosophy students. This is necessary to build the future of science. I'm not saying we should turn down the walls of the physics building or the biology building because we'd freeze if we did that, but we need to do it metaphorically. We need to tear down the walls between different disciplines that exist in our minds, and that's my take-home message for today. <laughs>